Hello, and welcome to our presentation this evening, Back to School Muncie Education History. I am Sarah Allison, Head of Archives User Engagement in the Archives and Special Collections Department in the University Libraries. This is a community collaboration between the Ball State University Libraries, Delaware County Historical Society, Minnetrista, and the Muncie Public Library. Our presentation this evening, along with the Q&A portion, is being recorded and will be made available through the Ball State University Library's digital media repository. <clears throat> so first things first, we have some housekeeping rules. You are free to have your video on, but given the number of participants we are expecting this evening, it will help with bandwidth for videos to be turned off. For the time being, we have muted everyone and ask that you stay muted throughout the presentation. There will be time for questions at the end of the presentation. If you wish to ask a question, you can use the chat box. The, bu the button to access the chat is located in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. When using the chat box, please make sure that the to field is labeled to everyone. This way all participants can see the question. If you wish to ask your question verbally, we will ask that you raise your virtual hand. This function is also in the toolbar under the reaction button and located at the bottom of the options. Right now, I'm going to ask that everyone who is able to enter into the chat that you can at least hear me and see our presentation slides. Oh, no, oh, there we go, okay, good. <laughs> At first, I was going to think no one can see or hear me. Wonderful. Okay. So we're going to go ahead and get started. So um, let's start by doing some introductions. As I mentioned, uh, I am Sarah Allison, Head of Archives User Engagement at Ball State University Libraries, and I will be your moderator this evening. We're going to be hearing from Melissa Gentry, who is the supervisor in the GIS Research and Map Collection at Ball State University Libraries and a founding member of the Notable Women of Muncie and Delaware County Committee for the Delaware County Historical Society. Jessica Jenkins is the Vice President of Collections and Storytelling at Minnetrista, author of Exploring Women's Suffrage Through 50 Historic Treasures and a founding member of the Notable Women Project Committee of the Delaware County Historical Society. Sarah McKinley is the local history and genealogy supervisor of Muncie Public Library and manager of the Carnegie Library. And Karen Vincent is the Delaware County historian, president of the Delaware County Historical Society and founding member of the Notable Women Project Committee of the Delaware County Historical Society. So let's give them all a virtual round of applause. As summer comes to an end, it is time for school supplies, pack lunches, class pictures, and group projects. School buildings, classrooms, and even the curriculum have changed over the years. Chalkboards have been replaced by whiteboards or digital screens, and uh, clothes designing classes have morphed into full-on productions. This evening, as we gather, as if we are at the new school year assembly, we will hear about education pioneers, take a look back at St. Lawrence School and learn about a Ball State educational program of yesteryear. So our first presenter this evening will be Jessica Jenkins. Thanks, Sarah. Hi, everybody. Um, so my name is Jessica and I'm here this evening to talk to you a little bit about a woman whose career in and impact on education didn't happen in Muncie, but whose name is very familiar in our community. And actually, Sarah, if you could go ahead to the next slide. Um, before I get started, I do want to make sure to give credit where credit is due. And while I am personally fascinated uh, with the story that I'm gonna tell tonight, I will say I did not pull together the research. Uh, our curator, Nayeli Guillen, did all of the legwork, but she wasn't able to join us tonight. So I am just pinch hitting for her. So eh, I'm probably not as good as Nayeli, but this is what you get. <laughs> so Sarah, next slide. So with that, let's kind of get going here. So I'm sure that probably a lot of you are familiar with the building scene here. So constructed in 1927, Lucina Hall on Ball State University's campus has really long been a, kind of a recognizable piece of architecture in Muncie. 
And while many Ball State students today know about the many, many services housed inside the building, things like admissions, registration, financial aid, um, really serving as a welcome center for campus, um, I often wonder how many of those students know who Lucina is that the building is named after, and more importantly, how many know about her career in education? Next slide. So for those of you with us tonight who don't know, Lucina Ball was the eldest sister of the Ball brothers. And although she passed away in 1901 and never relocated to Muncie full time like her male siblings, members of the Ball family really always spoke about her with kind of endless affection. And they really acknowledged her important role in the Ball family as a moral compass and a guide. And in his memoirs, her younger brother, Frank Seaball, wrote that Lucina had a charming disposition. All who knew her admired her. The members of the family looked to her for counsel and advice. And Frank was very right. <laughs> we know from letters that that, that happened a lot. Um, and in 1928, at the dedication of Lucina Hall at Ball Teachers College, Lucina's brother-in-law, Joseph Mock, said that the root meaning of Lucina is the word light. And in naming the building after her, Mock really hoped that Lucina would bring Ball State's um, light to its future students, just as she had the Ball family. Next slide, please. So while Lucina was absolutely a guiding moral compass for her younger siblings, her life was really much bigger than that. Um, she lived a really big, independent life and did a lot of really incredible work at a time when women were really still fighting for their place in public life. So Lucina's concern and really love for her brothers led her to champion new educational opportunities for young people like her siblings, boys with a lot of ambition, but maybe not a lot of means. And in fact, Lucina's work in higher education was part of a pioneering advancement in education for all, both men and women, and not just the wealthy. She was really on the front line of late 19th century education reform that really went on to help young people better their lots in life. Sarah, if we could go to the next slide. So let's take a few steps back momentarily, though. Um, Lucina Amelia Ball was born in Greensburg, Ohio in 1847, and she was the oldest child of Lucius and Mariah Ball and the eldest sister of the Ball brothers. And in the 1860s, the family relocated to Canandaigua, New York. And while the community was beautiful and proved to be a really good home for the Ball family, in the late 1860s, when Lucina was in her late teenage years, she traveled to nearby Buffalo to attend school. Next slide. So according to family tradition, Lucina graduated from Buffalo Central School, and that was Buffalo's first official public high school. And Lucina's education was clearly really important to her family because they supported her completing her studies through what was really an incredibly trying time at home. Her father, Lucius, wrote to her in January of 1868, we would very much like to have you at home to assist us in our trouble, but it would not be advisable for you to leave your school at present. Go on with your studies so as to get through as soon as you can. And at the time he was writing this, this was when her youngest sibling, Clinton Harvey, was very, very ill. And he unfortunately passed away just a little bit over a year later in May of 1869. Next slide. Upon finishing high school, Lucina really dove into the working world so she could help support her family financially. And in fact, she really most likely was sent to school actually to get the training she needed to qualify for a career in teaching. You know, at that time, that was really a respectable choice for a young unmarried woman. And really wasting no time, she actually briefly opened her own small private school in Canandaigua, um, but she likely never had probably more than about seven students at any one time. Next slide. 
So while this small private teaching gig worked for a short while, um, Lucia's career journey really took a brief and interesting de detour <laughs> uh, when her uncle George Harvey Ball approached her to take a job working for a religious newspaper in New York City. So there she edited content, she worked with the printer to secure proofs, and sometimes she even assisted her uncle in picking up subscriptions and payments. And in the early 1880s, she really kind of continued on with this work in publishing, taking a position with Scribner and Company publishers in New York City, and later another one with the Free Baptist, a weekly religious newspaper. So while these jobs in the publishing world really developed a lot of Lucina's skills, she just couldn't stay away from her true love, which was education. And for Lucina, her interest in education was likely fueled in one part by her mother, who herself had been a teacher as a young woman, and maybe in another part by her desire to improve opportunities actually for her siblings. Um, given the affluence and financial success that the Ball Brothers achieved with the launch of Ball Brothers Glass later in life, it's kind of hard sometimes to remember that in their early years, they really were a family for whom money was a frequent concern. And for Lucina, the answer to that, to that problem for her brothers was to help secure their futures and financial security through education. She wanted them to go to school. And, you know, her thought was that would lead them to a better future. In the end, kind of funnily, uh, none of her brothers continued in school <laughs> beyond a primary education. Their entrepreneurial spirit and business experiments, in fact, paid off, even though Lucina didn't think they would. But Really, Lucina knew that not everyone was as lucky as her brothers, and she retained this soft spot in her heart for children of limited means and opportunity and really wanted to help them advance you know, their lives. So really fueled by that passion, she was prepared when opportunity presented itself, and she really took you know, charge in helping shape a new kind of educational outlook and perspective. Sarah, next slide. So when Ball Brothers Company made its big move from Buffalo, New York to Muncie in the 1880s, Lucina was also making a big move herself uh, in her career. And she was moving into a career in higher education administration. So from that point forward, Lucina was deeply involved in the establishment of three colleges, the Pratt Institute in Brooklyn, New York, the Drexel Institute of Art, Science, and Industry in Philadelphia, that's now Drexel University, and Keuka College in upstate New York. So Pratt, Drexel, and Keuka were definitely not ivory tower universities. They were, these were vocational schools, um, technical institutes designed to really provide practical education to working Americans without restrictions set by class, race, or gender differences. Next slide. So as an administrator, Lucina was really right in the middle of the action at these organizations. And with her boots on the ground, she helped to hire and pay staff, to raise funds, to organize administrative workflows and processes, and really to assist in student enrollment and financial aid. And she also played a really crucial role in developing curriculum. So Lucina believed really strongly in equitable missions for these organizations. And like she did when her brothers were young, she advocated really personally and fiercely to help young people find success in life through education. So I do wanna share one quick example before I wrap up. And this happened in 1895 when a young man and his father whose family was really stretched pretty thin financially, walked into the secretary's office at Drexel Institution. And the young man, Horace Liversidge, who's seen here on the screen, hoped to enter the Institute's electrical engineering course. So they went in there, they inquired, you know, the office started kind of totaling up expenses on their counting machine. And when all of those expenses were calculated of what it would cost for him to do that, Really, Horace thought it was pretty hopeless. Uh, and as he and his father turned to leave, his father said to him, well, son, it's certainly too bad, but it just can't be done. Hearing that exchange and possibly remembering her own brothers, however, Lucina took a personal interest in the young man. 
And she kind of popped out and said, hold on, I want to talk to you. <laughs> Found out a little bit more about Horace and his family. And Lucina took it upon herself to help secure a scholarship for Horace so he could realize his dream. So writing many, many years later to Lucina's brother, Frank, this is what Horace had to say. He said, you may be certain that your sister's suggestion of the scholarship renewed my hope. I know that I owe a great deal to Drexel Institute and an even greater obligation to your sister, Miss Ball, who through quick grasp of the situation and the human problem interceded upon my behalf. So like many other lives that Lucina touched, Horace really believed that she'd played a really vital role in setting his life path. And that was one that would transform from you know, a childhood and an adolescence and young adulthood of really financial insecurity to one where Horace eventually became the president of the Edison Electric Light Company of Philadelphia. So Sarah, one last slide. I think I have one more there. I do, <laughs> with a very nice picture of Lucina. So I will wrap it up here tonight. And so we have time for our other speakers, but I really kind of hope that this little brief teaser talk about Lucina Ball has done a little bit of legwork in bringing her story to light. You know, as I mentioned at the top of my talk, Lucina really was a moral compass and advisor to her younger siblings throughout her life. And in fact, she could really be quite the bossy pants, which I really like when you read her letters. She, she was a bossy, bossy lady and I like her, she's sassy. Um, but you know, her worry and her love for her family really led her to do really great things on her own merits, you know, especially as it relates to education reform here in the United States. So while in some ways she wasn't that outspoken reformer that we often think of, her life experiences really propelled her to support change in public education for the benefit of future families like hers, you know, families that really didn't have a ton of means, but had a great deal of ambition and just kind of needed a little bit of a hand and they were sure to succeed. So that's what I have for you. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. That was really great. Um, we have some time for some questions. If anyone wants to add any into the chat, we'll take a little break here. I do actually have one. Um, so thinking about, um, Lucina's philosophy about education and of course her focus uh, on kind of reforming education uh, for families like hers. Do you think that that led to the Ball Brothers uh, contribution to what we now call Ball State University? Absolutely. I don't, I don't think there's any question there. I think, you know, when you look at letters that Lucina was writing over many, many, many years to her brothers, she was just kind of hammering away the concept that education is important. Education is important. There's this really funny string of letters that she writes to Frank when he's younger and she thought he needed to get his act together and figure out something more stable to do. And she kept writing to him and saying, go to school, you should become a dentist. And so it's like letter after letter, like go to school, become a dentist. And eventually Frank was like, no, I think I got this. You know, we, <laughs> me and the brothers have this taken care of, but I think that that concern Honestly, I think they really absorbed it and they they understood that importance of what her message was. And I think it absolutely led to them seeing the importance of when there was a you know college that was floundering of them purchasing it to make it available to the state so that people could get an education. Absolutely. Wonderful. Um, Karen Vincent just put into the chat, many years ago, I sold Girl Scout cookies in Lucina Hall. That's pretty good. Love it. <laughs> okay, we're going to go ahead and move on to our next presenter, who is Sarah McKinley. All right. Thank you, Sarah. Um, if you want to go ahead and go to my first slide, um, I'm going to go through this kind of quickly because I have a lot of information. Um, but St. Lawrence School provided education to the youth of Muncie for 140 years. And while this can't possibly be a comprehensive history, I'd like to present a timeline, share a few stories from educators and students, and point you to a couple of resources where you can find more information. Um, I thought first that I would share that two of our panelists this evening are actually St. Lawrence School alumni. Panelist Karen Vincent and her father, Joe Hauser, pictured on the left, both attended St. Lawrence School. On the right, my great granduncle Peter and my grandfather, Charles Van Camp, myself and my brother Jamie and possibly others from the Van Camp side of our family were also students. 
my mother Joan, uh, pictured on the right also, uh, was hired in 1979 at St. Lawrence as the kindergarten teacher, uh, where she taught for 42 years, which is the longest of any of the teachers that weren't nuns. Um, and she now teaches at the new school, the St. Michael's School, which I'll talk about later. Uh, next slide. So it may be surprising to learn that St. Lawrence Parish and school have such a long history in Muncie. In fact, the history of the Catholic community in Muncie goes back about 180 years. Missionaries visited the village of Muncie, then known as Muncie Town, as early as 1840. The first Catholic priests began visiting when Muncie had only two Catholic families. In 1853, Reverend Maloney of Indianapolis came to Muncie to celebrate its first Catholic mass at the home of Patrick Tuey, which according to a newspaper article from 1938, I found out was actually located at the corner of Jackson and Jefferson. Uh, the houses that were uh, located there were later torn down so that the Carnegie Library could be constructed in 1902. So our local history and genealogy library actually sits on the same lot where the first Catholic mass was held in Muncie over 160 years ago. For the next several years, additional priests visited and held mass in the private homes of Muncie's growing Catholic community, but attempts to build a mission church failed until 1869, when Reverend Lawrence Lamour came to Muncie from Union City and saw to the construction of Muncie's first Catholic church. The church, constructed in 1873, was a one-room brick structure and was named for St. Lawrence in honor of the church's pastor, Lawrence Lamour. Among other things, um, St. Lawrence is the patron saint of school children, the poor, cooks, and comedians. St. Lawrence Parish would serve as the only Catholic parish in Muncie for 61 years until St. Mary Church was established in 1930. Next slide. So here's where we get to the school history. Uh, Reverend W.G. Schmidt, who was the St. Lawrence Church's pastor from 1874 to 1920, erected the city's first Catholic school in 1881. The first St. Lawrence school was a two-story wood frame structure and consisted of one large room and one long room on the lower floor with a large classroom on the upper floor. The school had 50 students enrolled and Father Schmidt was the school's only teacher for its first year. In addition to teaching, Reverend Schmidt served his pastoral duties, traveling by horse, hand car, and later bicycle between Muncie, Hartford City, and Montpelier. After the first year of school, a lay teacher was hired, and then students were taught by the Sisters of St. Joseph from Ohio. In 1887, the Sisters of St. Joseph were replaced by the Sisters of St. Agnes. The Sisters of St. Agnes that came to Muncie from Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, included a housekeeper and two teachers. In 1893, the current St. Lawrence Church, pictured at right, was constructed on East Charles Street. At this time, the old church was converted into two schoolrooms, thus St. Lawrence School now comprised of two buildings and four schoolrooms. In 1899, a souvenir booklet of Muncie stated, quote, from the earliest beginnings, Father Schmidt, at a great personal sacrifice, has maintained a school, which is today in a most flourishing condition and contains a roll of 330 students who are now under the care of the Sisters of St. Agnes, end quote. Next slide, please. In 1901, a new St. Lawrence School building was constructed. During construction, Reverend Schmidt had the, quote, old church schoolrooms torn down, and the first school building was used as a club room and for basketball games for a couple more years. Construction of the new school was actually still underway when the fall term began in 1901. So Father Schmidt rented two rooms in a former blacksmith shop to accommodate students for the first four to six weeks. In later years, alumni recounted amusement about their school days in the blacksmith shop. The new school was made of brick with eight school rooms on the first and second floors, each measuring 27 feet by 27 feet. A hallway separated the classrooms on each floor and a large auditorium called the hall was located on the third floor. Alumni who attended school in this building recalled the hall hosted plays, dances, bazaars, meetings, and commencement exercises. The school was well lit, had well-equipped classrooms and was scientifically ventilated. The building also had a modern heating system as it was heated by steam and it was lighted with natural gas with electricity reserved for emergencies. The Muncie News reported, quote, the new parochial school at the corner of East Charles and South Hackley streets will stand as a monument to the growth and progress of the school, which was founded 20 years ago by Reverend Schmidt. 
He has seen a handful of students occupying one room in a frame structure that has just been abandoned, grow into a school of more than 400 students, and he is proud to dedicate the new handsome school. Kemper's 1908 history of Delaware County called the school one of the finest parochial school buildings in Indiana. Next slide. By this time, there were now seven sisters from St. Agnes teaching 400 students in grades one through eight and one housekeeper. When Reverend Schmidt resigned in 1920, his successor, Reverend Edward J. Houlihan, was especially concerned with keeping the building in good repair and dreaming of a high school established a high school fund. When Reverend Houlihan died in 1940, Monsignor Felix Sarazinski became pastor. In 1948, ground broke for a convent behind the church and the Sisters of St. Agnes moved into this building in 1949. Their former convent was later used as the school cafeteria. In 1948, the Mother Sisters Guild was also organized with Mrs. Ruth Lafferty as its first president. The picture in the lower right shows a booth at one of their events. The Mother Sister Guild was the predecessor of the Parent Teacher Organization, or PTO. The Guild organized bake sales, rummage sales, and suppers to raise funds for various educational items, such as purchasing laboratory equipment for the science classes. Volunteers from the Guild also operated the school cafeteria. Since we're presenting on the back to school theme, I thought I'd share a couple of fun stories of students getting into mischief in the building. The first is actually a story that my grandfather used to tell us about his class in the 1940s, which by no fault of his own was a class notorious for getting into trouble. It was tradition that every Thanksgiving, the students would present a turkey as a gift to the nuns. This particular year, several boys in the class decided to present a live turkey and snuck it into the classroom. The nun, who was startled, jumped up on the table as the turkey escaped the classroom and ran through the hall with the nun calling behind, get the turkey, get the turkey. So um, another story comes from Sister Jean Perry, who recalled in a Ball State interview that when she was a student in the first ninth grade class in 1950, physical education was a state requirement for ninth grade and the students walked twice a week from St. Lawrence to McKinley Junior High for PE, whether it rained or snowed. During the lunch hour, if the students weren't at McKinley Junior High, they would go upstairs for recreation where there was a pool room, a ping pong room, an old Victrola where they'd play music and dance, or they'd play cards or chess or play with a pinball machine. She recalled that on one occasion, she went to the convent and lied to the sisters saying that she'd left something in the auditorium and asked for the keys. They gave her the keys and she led a group of students into the auditorium for dancing. At some point, she looked out the window and saw the president of the CYO coming with supplies to fill the pop machine on the third floor. So she led the students to run out on the circular fire escape. And as one student after the other came out the door, Monsignor Sarazinski was standing there and the children just kept on running. Next slide. So the following year in 1951, the old convent had been converted into a junior high. And in 1953, ground broke on the third school building. Monsignor Sarazinski laid the cornerstone for the building, which was dubbed a high school as the late Reverend Houlihan had hoped that it would become, but ultimately it only operated as an elementary and junior high school serving grades one through nine until the ninth grade was dropped in 1968. In 1953, not only was a new school building erected, but a new sports team name emerged as well, the Rams. The first mention of the St. Lawrence Rams appeared in Muncie newspapers on November 11th, 1953, when the St. Lawrence Rams defeated Wharton in the junior basketball opening game of the season at Blaine Gym, winning 62 points to 27. In 1960, Monsignor Sarazinski retired and his successor, Monsignor Schwer, had the old 1901 school building torn down in 1968. Next slide. In 1977, the St. Lawrence parishioners were given the shocking news that the Sisters of St. Agnes would leave after 90 years of teaching at St. Lawrence School. The Sisters of St. Agnes community was founded as a teaching order and later added nursing. The sisters reported that times were changing and the interests of girls entering the convent had shifted more towards social work, parish ministry, and religious education. Monsignor Schwer reassured the Muncie community that St. Lawrence would continue to operate with a staff of lay teachers, which had been operating at the school since 1970. One of these teachers was Christina Jones, who was hired at the school around 1974. 
She recalled in a Ball State interview that the Sisters of St. Agnes taught her how to be more strict and disciplined as a teacher, but they were also a lot of fun outside of school. She loved to get together with them to have popcorn parties and watch movies. She continued to correspond with the sisters even after they retired. After the sisters left St. Lawrence, Dr. Ellen O'Sullivan became principal in 1977 and additional well-qualified teachers were hired to fill the positions left open by the sisters' departure. Next slide. When Monsignor Schwer retired, Reverend John Schultz, Reverend Raymond Weber, and later Reverend Lewis Heights were the next priests of the parish. Reverend Heights taught religion classes to all grades, which by 1982 included a kindergarten through sixth grades. Kindergarten was located in a small building, which later became the Madonna shop. A preschool operated in the basement of Saint, the St. Saint Agnes building from 1986 to 88. Former student Michelle Belt, who attended kindergarten in the small building in 1987, recalled in a Ball State interview that on her first day of school, she was a little scared that, um, after her mother dropped her off, and she was off by herself during recess. Reverend Heights, who was known to walk around and converse with students to see how everyone was doing, noticed her standing in the corner by herself. He offered his hand and invited her to sit and talk with him, asked her his, her name and what was wrong. And Michelle said it made her feel so much better to know that he took the time to show that she was important and that she wasn't alone. Incidentally, I was in the same class with Michelle and she became one of my closest friends at St. Lawrence. I'm not surprised by her story of Reverend Heights as she, he was very highly thought of by all of the students, teachers, and church parishioners and was very engaged with the school as were many of the priests. Next slide. In 1988, the former Franklin Middle School building on 16th Street became available. School principal Francis Lafferty and Reverend Heights coordinated the purchase of the building from the city. Principal Lafferty took a new position at Northside Middle School and Emily Cress was hired as principal of the new St. Lawrence School building. The school operated as an elementary school and re-added a middle school from 1991 to 2009. Cress served as principal and, and a teacher at St. Lawrence and now serves on the archives committee. Next slide. The school's fall festival continued to be one of the popular events for the city at the new school and was held annually in the school gymnasium and surrounding property. A lip sync contest, school raffle, carnival games, goodie booths, craft sale rooms, face painting, a dinner, and auction were popular offerings at the event. Hay rides and haunted houses were also sometimes offered. In the fall of 1997, uniforms became part of the school's dress code for the first time. Next slide. In 2016, the 16th Street building was sold to Inspire Academy, which had previously rented space from St. Lawrence. Inspire occupied the main portion of the building with St. Lawrence's grades K through five in the Southwest Wing. Although St. Lawrence had been an A-rated school for at least 15 years and was recognized as a four-star school by the state of Indiana, enrollment had declined. 2020 to 2021 was St. Lawrence School's final year in Muncie as a merger of St. Lawrence and St. Mary schools would take place. Next slide. In August 2020, the Catholic community in Muncie, St. Lawrence, St. Mary, and St. Francis combined to form the Muncie Pastorate of the Diocese of Lafayette in Indiana. In 2021, St. Lawrence and St. Mary schools combined to form the new school, St. Michael Catholic School, which now operates from the former St. Mary school buildings. Their new mascot is the Archangel, and the school colors are blue and green, a nod to the blue from St. Mary's school colors and green from St. Lawrence school colors. Next slide. Through an agreement with the St. Lawrence School Archives, the Muncie Public Library has digitized the St. Lawrence School yearbooks. They are available for free online by going to munciepubliclibrary.org slash Carnegie and clicking the link for the Delaware County, Indiana School Yearbooks Collection. Next slide. You can also learn more about the history of Muncie St. Lawrence Parish and School by visiting the Ball State Digital Media Repository and accessing the St. Lawrence Catholic Church Oral History Project. Among others, interviews include former St. Lawrence School students and teachers. So I hope you've learned a little bit more about St. Lawrence School tonight or that this took some of you down memory lane. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. That was great. Um, if anyone has any questions, go ahead and put them into the chat. Um, I, I was wondering, the, the former school building on uh, Charles Street by the church, is, is it still standing? And if so, what's it used for now? 
Uh, yes, so the the last uh, school building that was constructed there is still standing. Um, it has several occupants, including the St. Vincent de Paul thrift store, the soup kitchen, and the St. Lawrence School archives are also housed there, which is a, a closed archive, but um, that's where it's located. I was also wondering too, this is a totally new question I just thought of by actually watching the presentation. <laughs> um, why, why did the school uniforms take so long to come about, do you know? I really don't. Um, I thought it was um, interesting when I was a student there that they didn't require uniforms. Um, so I'm, I'm really not sure of the answer to that question, why they waited until the late 90s to decide to add them. But I know a lot of the public schools were starting to add them around that point too. So that might have had an effect. Okay. Well, if you do have a question, um, go ahead and put it into the chat, but we're going to go ahead and move on to our next presenter. Who will be Karen Vincent? Okay. Well, thank you, Sarah. You told me so much more about St. Lawrence than I ever knew, and definitely brought back a whole lot of memories. Um, I wish I'd had the photo of my brother. It was during First Communion, and you could see he was right next to the priest who had his arm wrapped around him. I and mean, I'm sure there was a reason why he had his arm wrapped around him, too. So uh, I just I went to St. Lawrence through fourth grade uh, and then attended Anthony Elementary School in fifth and sixth grade. And I don't remember ever hearing how Anthony got its name while I was there. Um, most Muncie and Center Township schools were named for a president like Lincoln or a poet like Eugene Field or a local newspaper editor like Wilbur Sutton or even a direction like Westview. But Anthony Elementary, which is no longer a school, although the building is still standing, was named for local educator and a man of many talents. Harvey Mitchell Anthony. And next slide, please. So Harvey's roots in Delaware County ran deep. He was the only child of Charles and Harriet Mitchell Anthony. And Harriet, I'm sure many of you know, was more commonly known as Diamond Heels Hattie. Hattie's father, Harvey Mitchell, was a physician and landowner. He also invested in real estate and owned properties throughout Delaware County. When he died, one of his buildings, the Mitchell Block in downtown Muncie was nearing completion. And according to his obituary, Mitchell at the time of his death was one of the wealthy men of Muncie. He and his wife, Catherine died within just a few days of each other. Hattie was their only surviving child and their sole heir. Charles Haynes Anthony was the son of Edwin and Rebecca Anthony and the grandson of Samuel P. Anthony, a Delaware County pioneer physician who amassed a large fortune in real estate. Dr. Anthony owned properties in Delaware and adjoining counties and in several Western states. And he was in one of the largest stockholders in the Citizens National Bank of Muncie. And according to his obituary, he may have been worth as much as $250,000 at the time of his death in 1876, or approximately $6 million in today's money. That wealth and good business, uh, next slide, please. <laughs> that wealth and good business sense trickled down to his grandson, and Charles Anthony took advantage of the natural gas and oil boom of the 1880s and added to the family fortune as an organizer and president of Economy Gas Company and Daniel Boone Oil Company. He was also a trustee of the Sprinkle Bank, which later became the Delaware County National Bank. Charles owned the Anthony Block and other property in Muncie and in Florida. With this background, Harvey grew up in privilege and wealth. And his name started appearing in the society news when he was only about three years old, as he regular and regularly thereafter, as he attended numerous birthday parties, dances, and other soirees. Next slide, please. Harvey attended Muncie schools and graduated from Muncie High School in 1908. While there, he played football and tennis and pledged Beta Phi Sigma for, uh, fraternity. He also managed to get expelled once when he and eight other students left the building to see the Ritchie home on West Adams Street burn. When they returned to the school, Principal Wiles met them at the door and told them that they needn't come back in. 
The expulsion only lasted a few days, but Harvey apparently got the message. and There didn't seem to be any more trouble while he was in high school. Next slide, please. In the fall after his graduation from Muncie High School, Harvey enrolled at Miami University in Oxford, Ohio. Next slide, please. And there he promptly got involved in a number of activities, including serving as the freshman class vice president. Next slide. He also continued his athletic interest from high school, but he played basketball uh, at uh, Miami University, also played tennis, and won an Ohio State Championship on a couple of different occasions. He also joined a fraternity. And it's possible that he took on a few too many activities since he wasn't able to finish his freshman year in two semesters. He was listed as a freshman in both the 1909 and 1910 yearbooks. But he soon buckled down uh, with his studies and specialized in mathematics and languages. He also started to develop an interest in science and engineering. After three years at Miami, Harvey entered Harvard University, where he majored in science and philosophy. He also became interested in the relatively new field of radio telegraphy. According to his obituary, Harvey did postgraduate study in electrical engineering at Polytechnical Institute in Boston. I couldn't find anything about Holly Technical Institute. And I wonder if it might have been something that then got absorbed into the uh, uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. I'm not sure. Um, but he also took courses at Columbia University and the New York Electrical Institute. And again, couldn't find any information on that one. Uh, other sources say that he also studied at MIT and at Boston College. He also took a course in electrical science at Glasgow University in Scotland. Uh, next slide, please. Wherever he studied and all the places he studied, he made a splash in the world of science. Described in a Muncie Evening Press article that was about his mother's travels as a husky, unadorned, Jim Blunt sort of a chap who ever crossed the threshold of Harvard College. It was noted that from his tawny hair to his stubby boots, he is a typical son of the Middle West with one great ambition to be a brighter light in the scientific world than his adored mother's gems are in the realm of society. And he did become that brighter light. Uh, next slide, please. Another article in the press in 1914 noted that, I did that a little fast, but we'll go on, uh, noted that several of Harvey's inventions had attracted interest among scientists, including a new and economical process of purifying water and a new heterodyne audion radio tele uh, telephone transmitter. Harvey brought this great scientific promise back to Muncie in September 1915, when he became head of the newly formed Department of Applied Electricity at Muncie High School, the first such program in the state. This program in the newly built school included instruction in magnetism, heat, light, power generation, illumination, and high voltage transmission. Telephony and telegraphy were also taught, as were shopmen mathematics, drafting, and blueprinting. Graduates of this program were ready to go on to further studies or directly to work as an electrician or some uh, other position in the electrical field. Teaching at uh, high school wasn't all business for Harvey, uh, though. Basketball was his sideline. Harvey set up his own radio station and teamed up with several of his students to broadcast reports of Muncie High School basketball games. Now we're on to this slide. In 1917, with the United States entry into World War I looming, Harvey entered the Navy. Initially, he conducted radio telegraphy cap classes and organized a signal corps in, in, here in Muncie. He was then assigned to the Great Lakes Naval Training Station where he was promoted to Chief of Radio Telegraphy. In an October 1918 letter to Lucy Ball, his fiancee at the time, Harvey reported that he had been transferred to Washington, D.C. and assigned to the Aircraft Consultation Board, where he would be responsible for all radio apparatus in American aircraft production. 
He wrote to Lucy, I have been sent here to this factory to take over the radio department and start about 50 men here and a number of chiefs on the installation of radio apparatus on the battle planes made here. He then noted that he would be sent to Buffalo, New York to do the same work and then probably on to Toronto and Ottawa. He requested at least four times to be sent overseas, but he never made it there. He told Lucy, I will hate to see the peace declared and me never in Europe, but that's out of my hands entirely. After the war, Harvey returned to Muncie High School where he continued to teach and to serve as director of vocational education for the school. In addition, he regularly lectured to clubs such as Rotary and Kiwanis, uh, also school clubs on a number of scientific subjects, including one of his favorites, astronomy. He also established the Harvey Mitchell Anthony Science Medal, which was awarded to the student having the best average grade each year in physics and chemistry. Next slide. <laughs> On August 9, 1922, Harvey married Muncie resident Ruth Leffler. It was noted in the press that the wedding came as a surprise and is of exceptional interest to local society. Ruth also graduated from Muncie High School and from the National Kindergarten School of Chicago. And she had several teaching positions before marrying Harvey. They set up housekeeping on West Charles Street and she and Harvey had one daughter named Ann. In February, 1923, Harvey resigned his position at the high school to study medicine at the Indiana University School of Medicine. He was particularly interested in the use of electricity in medicine. And next slide, please. In 1926, Harvey had the highest score out of 112 graduate physicians who took the state medical examination. His internship was served at the Robert Long Hospital in Indianapolis, the first teaching hospital in what would become the Indiana University Medical Center. After completing his internship, uh, he taught an, uh, anatomy for a while at IU and also served as the, as the assistant physician at the university. Next, he moved to Gary, Indiana to practice medicine and lived there for three years. Uh, while living in Gary, Harvey also lectured several days a week at Northwestern University. He returned to Muncie after those three years in Gary to start a practice here. And unfortunately, this time his stay in Muncie was very brief. Just about a month after returning, Harvey was taken ill and died of a coronary thrombosis on May 18, 1931. He was only 41 years old. Survivors included his wife, Ruth, three-month-old daughter, and his mother. Next slide. More than 20 years after his death, Harvey's exemplary, exemplary career in education was memorialized when a new elementary school was built on Oakwood Avenue. Anthony Elementary School was actually built on land that Harvey Mitchell Anthony's grandfather, Dr. Samuel Anthony had once owned. Next slide. The, the school opened in September, 1958 and was dedicated on December 7th of that year. And next slide. Ruth Leffler Anthony, uh, obviously second from left, who never remarried, was an honored guest at the dedication. Next slide. Harvey achieved more in his short life than most could in several lifetimes. In addition to careers as a teacher and as a physician, he served as a consulting electrical engineer on the state board, uh, also served on the state board of registration for professional engineers and as the state commander of radio and intelligence service. And he was on the board of examiners for Indiana University School of Medicine. He was a member of the honor, Honorary Scientific Fraternity uh, Sigma Xi and held memberships in the Franklin Institute, the Academy of Natural Sciences, the American Geographical Society, the New England Academy of Sciences, and many other organizations. In 1919, he was made a fellow of the French Physical Society, a division of the French Academy of Science. He was the only American to be so honored that year and for several other years. It was quite a life that he led. 
Thanks, Karen. Um, we actually have a question in the chat uh, from Wendy Schultz. Uh, could Harvey have attended WPI in Worch Worch Worcester outside of Boston? Yeah, it's quite possible. He seemed to have, uh, reading several different sources about him, he attended, it seemed to have attended classes at a number of schools in the Boston area and then in the New York area too. So I, I wouldn't be surprised. I didn't see that specific name, but it quite possibly could be. I was also wondering too, um, did Mitchell's school have anything to do with the family? No. Uh, Mitchell School was actually named for three sisters who were involved in Muncie education for 40 plus years. Uh, two of them were teachers and one worked in administration. So uh, different different Mitchell family altogether. Okay. And also too, I know we're, we're kind of getting close to the time, but I, I have heard that he was a man about town in his younger days. <laughs> You know, I don't know where he found the time, but he was. He was engaged in 1912, so he would have just been about 22 at that time, <laughs> to a French singer. And then he was engaged again in 1914 to the daughter of a professor. Both of those were while he was at Harvard. And then in 1917, 1918, he was engaged to Lucy Ball, uh, daughter of Frank C. and Bessie Ball. And then, you know, he finally married Ruth. <laughs> I'd say yes. I, I think I heard correctly. All right. <laughs> If anyone else has any other questions, they can put it into the chat. Um, we're going to move on to our last presenter for, um, oh, Jen, Jennifer DeSilva has a quick question. Does anyone know if the Anthony Block had a radically, rascally, rascally reputation in the late 19th or early 20th century? It had a liquor store, billiard hall, and cigarette store and was close to the opera house. You know, I don't know that for sure. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised because <laughs> there were a lot of liquor stores and there were a lot of billiard halls. So <laughs> why not? She said, just wondering, question mark. Yeah. And then we had another one, <laughs> another we can find comment. out. Uh, Janine Harold said, I thought it appropriate when Lucina Ball became a student services building to honor Lucina Ball's career when it was remodeled in 1993. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Very nice comments. We're going to go ahead and move on to our last presenter this evening, um, Melissa Gentry. Hi, everyone. It's nice to see some um, friendly names on the <laughs> gallery. Okay, so when we think of traditional education, we tend to think about the classics. English, biology, history, mathematics. Next slide. In the early decades of the 20th century, scholars believe that scientific methods could be applied to the study of almost anything, including the domestic arts. Home economics departments around the country opened practice or laboratory houses where students learned how to be the perfect homemaker and believe it or not, the perfect mother. According to a report by NPR, between 1919 and 1969, at least 50 universities across the United States, including Columbia in New York, regularly borrowed young babies from orphanages and guardian homes to use as subjects in home economics laboratory houses. Women were taught homemaking skills and strictly scheduled scientific child rearing. Next slide. At Ball State Teachers College, beginning in 1930, Dean Harry Howick allowed his house to become the home management house during the summers when he and his family vacationed. In the beginning, six women students stayed at the house and planned menus, did chores, and entertained university guests at dinner parties during two five-week summer terms. Later, a borrowed practice baby would be added to the group. The house was located on College Avenue, which originally intersected with University Avenue before the student center was built and then later expanded. So if you look at this map, um, when the student center was built in the 1950s, it was only half of what exists today. 
So the home management house would be located about where the post office is in the student center today. Next slide. You can make out the home management house in this aerial photograph. You can see Burkhart building in the foreground and the administration, administration building just beyond and North Quad to the right. Next slide. The student newspaper boasted that the home economics course, quote, turns out perfect little housewives. Well, at least many of the vague and mistaken ideas of said future housewives are ironed out, unquote. And these prized homemakers would also know how to keep a baby quiet. So, quote, irate husbands won't be walking the floor at night with squalling infants, unquote. Next slide. The program was well-meaning and considered pioneering at the time. And without the modern knowledge of attachment disorder, scholars believe that having more qualified caregivers would be beneficial for the baby. And the baby seemed to flourish. Many of the babies were malnourished and developed mentally behind when they arrived. These babies became plump, started using more words, and started taking steps. Potential parents jumped at the chance to adopt one of these so-called practice babies. One woman in nearby Henry County saw a picture of a baby girl and told her husband, that's my baby, and adopted her shortly after the baby left the home management house. Next slide. In June of 1932, the first baby arrived at the home management house. 10 month old Skippy had the honor of being the first baby ever taken into a practice house in the state of Indiana. His schedule was stringent. Skippy was awakened at 6 a.m. for milk and put in his crib for bed at exactly 6 p.m. He ate at the same time, played at the same time and slept or at least was in his crib at the same time every day. He was, he was given cod liver oil, at the same time every day. The students were trained not to pick up Skippy every time he cried. Every day he received a naked sun bath in the yard or was given ultraviolet treatments in the college health center, kind of like a tanning bed for babies. According to the newspaper though, quote, taking care of Skippy has turned out to be far from a cold scientific experiment. You should see those six modern college girls dote over that baby you would think Skippy the firstborn of all of them, unquote. One student admitted that the greatest difficulty was not spoiling him. Next slide. The students too had strict schedules and duties. Each took turns as the child director, assistant child director, cook, assistant cook, housekeeper, and manager. They planned menus, they kept a record of Skippy's activities, weight and height, they created a baby book and even, so, even sewed clothes and bibs for the baby. In August, Skippy was returned to the Guardian home in Indianapolis. He had gained two pounds, grown an inch in height, and quote, his pale color has changed to a healthy tan, unquote. Next slide. Baby Gordon, shown here on the left, arrived in the summer of 1933 for what the student newspaper called, quote, 10 weeks of combined discipline and vacation, unquote. Eight-month-old Marilyn June arrived on campus in the summer of 1934 for 10 weeks and 13 mothers. President Pittenger made a special trip to the house to meet her. Next slide. Little Donald Ray arrived in June of 1935 and was called a ladies' man in the paper. Next slide. The summer of 1936 saw the arrival of baby Shirley, aged 10 months. Quote, Shirley's good nature is evidence in her love of spinach. And like all fashionable young women, she is acquiring a suntan in her periods of outdoor play, unquote. Shirley had the honor of meeting a sister in this unique sorority when baby Marilyn June from 1934 came to visit the home management house as a toddler. Interestingly, Marilyn June also returned to Ball State in 1951 as a college freshman. Next slide. Baby Miriam was seven months old when she arrived in 1937. Next slide. Baby Violet was very sick when she came to the house in 1938. So Professor Mary Beeman took her to the hospital where she stayed for eight days with bronchitis. But Violet recovered well at the home management house. 
The archives here in Bracken Library has Violet's baby book, where she was described as sunshine. Quote, after living with Violet for five weeks, one has a satisfied feeling that her experience has been greatly broadened and that the student, as well as Violet, has learned many valuable things, unquote. Next slide. Here's a copy of Violet's strict schedule of feeding, playing, and sunbathing and receiving university guests every hour or every day for an hour at four o'clock. In the second summer term, a second home management house across the street hosted seven student mothers and baby Walter, nicknamed Dubby. His biological mother was one of the students at that second home management house. Next slide. In 1939, Ball State University purchased Dean Howick's home and it became a year round home management house. Babies would now participate during the fall and spring term. Baby Dudley, the oldest of the babies at 18 months, arrived that summer. He's standing in his outdoor playpen here on the left. Next slide. Oh, I'm sorry. Go, if you can go back. <laughs> Frances Elaine is here on the right. She arrived for the fall semester and stayed for two years through 1941. The student newspaper reported that baby Frances said daddy, but was afraid of men because she was, quote, living in a woman's world, unquote. Baby Frances, um, the baby on the right, had over 60 student mothers. Another baby, Glenola, lived at that second house in 1941. She was featured in the newspaper article with the headline, Tomato Juice Makes Glenola a Beautiful Babe. Next slide. Baby Lucky in 1942 was adopted by a fraternity while living at the house. The newspaper announced, quote, have you met the newest triangle pledge? Yes, girls, curly blonde hair and deep blue eyes. But don't rush all at once, please. You see, he already has eight women showering him with affection every minute of the day. This young man has it all over the rest of Ball State students. No classes to attend, just sitting at home to be waited on by his eight eager feminine admirers, unquote. And little Lucky even wore a triangle pledge pin on his sweater. Next slide. Baby Patricia on the left was the Prosec baby in 1943. And Martha Ann on the right moved on campus at only nine weeks old in the fall of 1944. Next slide. Baby Larry arrived in 1945, the same time as new faculty member, Martha Wickham, shown here at the head of the table. President Emmons recruited Wickham over the telephone for her job and to her surprise explained, of course, you'll have a baby. And you can actually watch um, Martha Wickham's um, oral history interview on the DMR. Next slide. In 1947, the newspaper bragged that Jama Lee loved music. Quote, of course, Jama Lee is on the way to becoming a Frank Sinatra Bobby Soxer, unquote. Next slide. Leah Kay lived in the house in the fall of 1947. And another baby, the son of a football player, stayed during the week while his parents took classes. In 1948, two married students who were both veterans of World War II let their baby stay in the care of the home management house during the week, although they did visit every day. These babies were known as suitcasers. Next slide. This was a pattern that continued through 1953 where working student parents left their baby at the home management house. This was one of the last practice babies, Baby Wayne in 1952, a suitcaser from Muncie. Next slide. Here's part of a poem that we found in Baby Violet's um, baby book. Oh, what a lucky baby I am, he often used to cry, to have a hundred mamas to make me hush a bye. A hundred lovely mamas whose love is ever overflowing. The only difficulty was the baby kept on growing. And now he's grown to be a man and grievously he misses. The care of his model mamas, their cuddling and their kisses. And oft he murmurs to himself with his scowl from the Sunday comic, do they need a practice husband in the College of Home Economics? Thanks, Melissa. Um, I was, you said that baby Wayne was the last 
baby that was what 1953 did the program in there or yeah, did it was, continue in some last, form I think he was the second to last um I think there was one after him and it um because they were suitcasers um like in most of the yearbooks they had a whole page dedicated to the practice babies but once they became suitcasers and their parents were actually either on campus or nearby they quit publishing um like their last names and things like that so it became more anonymous i remember when i first got here and heard about this program of the borrowed babies i thought it was a bit weird um, but but actually i mean it is part of i guess the home economic education trend and institutions like columbia would have a program as well i just thought it was a, a little bit weird yeah. um, <laughs> so thank you for that uh, if anyone has any questions um go ahead and put them into the chat wendy uh, says baby wayne is black were there other babies of color there he was the only um baby of color that i found there were um i think three that i couldn't find any pictures of so i can't be certain Okay. Well, thanks, Melissa. Do we have any other questions for, for any of our other presenters this evening? You can go ahead and put them into the chat. I can look through to see if anyone's got their hand raised. Um, so just a couple of quick announcements. Melissa, did you want to talk about your Instagram account? Yeah, if you're not following the Muncie Notables right now, that's the best place to keep track of um, any of the programs that we do that are related to the Notable Women of Muncie and Delaware. Also, too, by back by popular demand, we will be doing the Erie Muncie sequel on October 25th. If you did not join us last year, it was a big hoot and a lot of people really enjoyed it. So we will be doing it again. Um, I'm, I think there's UFOs. I know that much. We'll be talking about UFOs, but um, and possibly even sea monsters. So please join us if you're interested, uh, or um, look for the registration link. It should be be sent out to you soon. Um, and so also too, on behalf of our presenters this evening, I'd like to thank you for joining us. I think we're going to try and put our survey into the chat. Sarah did it for me there. Thank you. Um, if you could take a few minutes to uh, to fill it out, that would be great. It helps us kind of think about some ideas for continuing our presentation program. And if there aren't any other questions, um, thank you for joining us this evening and hope to see you at our next presentation.